these slaves had converted and now they're going to church with their masters and they're saying, well, we're equal in Christ, rightly so. They are, but then they had applied our radical egalitarianism that uh, eliminates all stations, all hierarchies and all that. And Paul is saying, not so. No, that is still here. You know, you still have to honor them. And matter of fact, they're, they're fellow believers. You should work even harder. So here we are back in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1 through 2. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1 through 2, New Testament, about midway through. All right. All who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. Those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren. But they must serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and redeemer. May the truth of this passage be rightly divided. May it be applied to the hearts of all here today for your glory and their good. In the name of your son, Jesus, I ask. Amen. Amen. In preparing a sermon, a pastor must ask a lot of questions and answer a lot of questions. And in my assessment, the two most uh, important questions uh, are what is the author's original intent for his original audience? And uh, the other one would be how can I apply the truth and principles that passage uh, in that passage to my particular congregation. So going with the first one, what is the author's original intent for the original audience? What is he saying to them in this passage, to the people at a first sense? So for us, this would be the church of Ephesus. Now, let me give you an example. It's instructive to remember that when Moses originally wrote, wrote the book of Genesis, he wrote it for the Israelites who were coming out of Egypt. And that's why when he talks about the Nephilim in Genesis 6, 4, he doesn't go into great detail on their identity. All he says is the Nephilim are in the earth in those days and also afterwards. That's it. And that's why, and here's why, the original audience already knew who they were and had encountered them in Numbers 13, 33. Matter of fact, that word only comes up twice in the whole Bible. Genesis 6, 4, Numbers 13, 33. There it reads, there also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Now, Nephilim were a dangerous, violent, pagan, warrior class of men. Their name can mean a couple of things. I interpret it as meaning to fall upon. But some other ones think it's fall, fallen ones. And they propose that there's some weird angel-human hybrid supervillain thingy. Right? That's their thoughts. They think... Genesis 6 is about demon babies. Um, I don't agree. I don't think so. The reason Moses brings up that there were Nephilim in the land in Genesis 6, 4 is to highlight the main conflict in that passage. Genesis 6, 11, uh, through 12, 6, 11 through 12 says, Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God. The earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. So corruption here doesn't mean sin. Corruption is talking about the way, so the way of worship. So there's all this violence, there's all this paganism. So namely, all had turned away from God and the world was full of violence. It was Moses saying, what was the world like back in Genesis 6? Well, it was similar to the violent pagan situation in the promised land when you first encountered the Nephilim, right? There was two Nephilim in the land back then. And as God cleansed the earth through the flood of water, he'll rid the promised land of its violent perversions through a flood of Israelites. If you look at it just in context, think through the author, it all kind of connects and makes way more sense than some of the more um, uh, creative solutions. Uh, so asking who the author is, who the audience is, 
and what he's trying to communicate to them will help you avoid anachronisms, right? These are, uh, an anachronism is an act of attributing a custom or an event or object to a period to which it does not belong. The word is derived from a Greek word which means against time or something like out of time. For example, in Back to the Future, Back to the Future, a movie ironically about time travel has Marty McFly uh, stuck in 1955 and a major part of the plot is him playing Johnny B. Good at a high school dance on a Gibson ES-345 uh, guitar, uh, which did not exist until 1958. So I doubt there's a deleted scene where Marty you know, fixes up his time-traveling DeLorean, hops forward to 1958, because that's the guitar he has to have. I know some musicians that are, are kind of like that. They would do that. Um, so you could pick it up just in time for Hill Valley High's Enchantment Under the Sea dance. I don't think that's what's going on. It's an anachronism. It's a mistake. It's an oversight. Here's another example. Deuteronomy 22.5 says, A woman shall not wear man's clothing, nor shall a man put on woman's clothing, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Right? Therefore, only, women should only wear dresses and never wear pants, right? That's what that's teaching. Well, first off, dudes didn't wear pants back then. Um, Second, the passage is deeper than that, much deeper. Clothing back then was directly connected with the work assigned to your sex and station in life. Think of it like a uniform, right? You, you can get in trouble for impersonating an officer if you put on a police officer's uniform and try to do things associated with that uniform, right? Uniform is designed for work and communicates that you're that type of worker. So I've heard people sometimes use this to, to call out transsexuals or transvestites that dress up, men that dress up as women or vice versa. Certainly you could use that as a passage, but there's a, a better application. Um, it would be, say something like, it's wrong for women to wear the clothing of a military combatant because that is men's clothing. It's associated with the work that they do. Right? Much more can be said about that, but my point is that the depth of this verse is missed due to modern debates on modesty. And therefore, our uh, anachronistic thinking robs us of scripture's uh, riches. Now our passage, what does this all have to do with anything? Opens with all who are under the yoke as slaves. It's a passage talking about slavery. And we are Americans. And when we hear the word slavery, we immediately think of it in terms of the largely race-based chattel slavery system of the American South prior to our uncivil war, a bloody and brutal war in which 620,000 Americans were killed by their own countrymen. Hence, it's a war that lingers in the American mind for good reason. I lived in the South for about, <clears throat> about five years, and I knew a little bit about the Civil War. I had to study it in college as part of my history undergrad, but the average guy down there knows more than just about, than I do. It's amazing. It's still in their mind. It lingers. And when you come to passages like this, um, people like to debate whether slavery in the South was as bad as it was depicted in Harriet Beecher Stowe's The Uncle, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Or in many of the modern movies. Right now it seems to be a lot of modern horror movies are are picking up on kind of slavery imagery as a big part of their plot. And they like to debate that. There's still a northern and liberal tendency to emphasize the worst aspects of that time and then apply it to all and every slave and slave owner. Don't mistake me for a neo-Confederate. I'm, I'm not. Uh, my grandma came over here in the 40s and my other side of my family came over just after the war. I'm it wasn't my deal. I wasn't involved in that. Um, there is also a Southern and conservative tendency to emphasize the best aspects of that time and then apply it uh, to all and every slave and slave owner. I can tell you, if you read guys like Thornwell, who uh, nothing more wanted to make sure that all the slaves could read the Bible themselves. He went out of his way to teach that. He had a massive ministry to them, or a guy named John Gerardo, who made sure that the church had black elders, not because of some affirmative action, 
but he was just making disciples. And that was a big thing in Charleston. Matter of fact, race relationships were so good in Charleston. When that white boy came into that church and shot up all those people, there were no riots. There were none at all. They had learned to live together. And so this idea of a sort of dystopian South during slavery is not true, but this also sort of the South shall rise again, like paradise. That's not true either. And you might think I'm trying to like shoot down the middle. I kind of am, but not because I'm afraid to offend any. That's just my read of history. And texts like ours are used as a stage to debate the accuracy of those depictions, whether it was really that bad, whether it was really that good. And I'm not saying that there aren't principles in this passage that can be deduced and applied to that period of history, but I'm not interested in that. I'm not at all. It would be wrong to read American chattel slavery into the ancient slavery Paul has in mind. It would be an anachronism. Commentators say there are roughly 50 to 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire around this time. In the major city, a large number of the people, perhaps a third or so, were slaves. They were not a small part of the population. And they all came from different backgrounds. It was rarely t- uh, tied to what we would call race these days. They were a major part of the population. By the time of the New Testament, the ancient form of slavery was declining and changing in big ways. Previously, there was guys like Aristotle, and they would talk of slaves as more or less human tools, a living tool. And Roman law still didn't see them as legal persons. Uh, it was, in many ways, the human, uh, treating them as if they didn't bear the Imago Dei, right? If they weren't equally human. But in the New Testament era, things were changing. Most slaves would end their lives free, and nearly 50% were freed before even turning 30. And Kent Hughes, the pastor, he writes, slaves under first century Roman law could generally count on eventually being set free. This was called manumission. Slave owners were releasing slaves at such a rate that Augustus Caesar introduced legal restrictions to curb the trend. So it was a major part of the economy, and because people were releasing them so quick, it was kind of destabilizing things, and hence he passed this law. There were uh, slaves. Uh, The slaves during that time could own their own property. The slaves could have their own slaves. Uh, They could hold public office. They could run their own businesses. Some even lived in their own homes. You could rarely tell the difference between a slave and a non-slave in that time. Does that sound like the slavery that we had here? Not on the whole. It's certainly of a different type, right? Now, was uh, ancient slavery all rosy? No, but it was rosier. (laughs) And that being said, though, 1 Corinthians 7, 21, Paul says, you were called while a slave. If you were called while a slave, do not worry about it. But if you are able also to become free, rather do it. In other words, serve the Lord wherever he has put you. But if you can gain your freedom, gain your freedom. Freedom is a blessing and to be pursued by all. And this is what Paul is dealing with in this passage. He's dealing with, let me say this as a a side note here. On passages like this, you either want to or don't want to, depending on what type of pastor you are, go to the hot button issues. Sometimes you can just pile Nephilim on it and talk about other hot button issues and confuse everybody. Um, But uh, a lot of times we're allowing our culture to set the curriculum, to pick the conversation we're having. And when we come to here and we make this all about Southern slavery, that is exactly what we're doing. Is this what Paul had in mind? No, it was a few years before Southern slavery, was it not? It was. So what does he have in mind? What, what does the original audience, uh, he, what are they hearing? That's what you have to ask. He's dealing with a congregation made up of a mix of slave owners, slaves, freedmen, and slaveless freedmen. Sometimes slaves actually, as, uh, to go back a second, slaves actually had more status money than the freedmen without slaves. So it's just a very different system. And now he's instructing Timothy on how to instruct them so that they honor God and that uh, the teaching of the Bible won't be maligned. And I'll come back to that in a second. Now, the second big question I ask when preparing a sermon 
is how can I apply the truth and principles in that passage to my particular congregation? It is not my chief job in preaching to apply these principles to another congregation, to another time, to another situation. God has placed me before you now. This time, this people, this situation. That's uh, why I speak. When I speak, I think of you guys. When I prep, I think of what you're going through. I think of your struggles. First Peter 5.3 talks about shepherding a flock allotted to your charge. Not all times face the same specific doctrinal battles. There are times where the Trinity is a big issue. There are times when the nature of justification is a big issue. And there's times like ours where we have judges literally saying, I don't know what a woman is, right? Yeah, so we live in an insane time where these people don't understand basic doctrines like anthropology, what it means to be human. But it didn't used to be that way. People say, whoa, where are their ancient uh, sources? What's your ancient documents on biblical sexuality? Well, the people weren't that stupid back then, right? They just weren't that dumb, right? It's crazy. I mean, who knew that that little kid in kindergarten cop was so controversial, right? Girls have vaginas, boys have penises. I remember him saying that. Like, this is not hard. Right, there's, there's no mystery here, but that's the insane time we live in. And while we have to say things like that in sermons, other times we didn't have to talk about that. There was a sort of knowledge that existed that hadn't been erased by a cultural tsunami of liberalism and egalitarianism, but it has come. And we face particular doctrinal battles. Not all times face the same specific societal struggles. There are struggles associated with being wealthy. It can be hard to have wealth. It's a lot of responsibility. Mo problems, right? Mo money, mo problems. That idea. How do you have to be a godly steward to who much is given, much is required. And there can be times where a society has it easy and it's easy to become lazy and slack and presumptuous. And then there's struggles associated with times of depression and recession and financial uh, tightness, perhaps where we're heading right now, right? And there's different problems there. The problems can be, you know, people that don't have a lot of money uh, tend to steal more because they don't have. Different classes and cultures struggle with different sets of sins. Blue collar has their sets of sin. White collar has their sets of sins. Americans this way, you know, non-Americans in a different way. And you, as a pastor, your job is to call out sins. I, I, it's kind of funny. <clears throat> I don't, I'm really not a troll. It, I don't try to be a troll. Some things are just spiritual gifts that you have. Um, and I don't try to do this. But the reason I critique reformed people so much is because I'm reformed. I'm reformed. Right? I want to deal with my own sins and my own people's sins. I could come up here and take the low hanging fruit and bash Joel Olstein. You guys watching Joel Olstein all the time? You got his study Bible? Is that a struggle in our church, Joel Olstein? I don't think so. Not very often. There may be a time and place, but I'm going to go after the things I struggle with and the things you struggle with. And that's why it hurts, right? You throw a rock into a crowd of dogs and the one that yipes is the one that got hit. So we all uh, face different things at different times. Not even, not even different churches in the same time face the same issue. You see this as you read the New Testament. Think of the church of Corinth and the church of Colossae. They both had a massive problem with Greek philosophy. The uh, Colossae, Colossian church blended it together with a sort of Jewish mysticism it's a very odd uh, combination of heresies. Um, it's like a dog having both ticks and fleas. You know, it's a, it's a mess. And the Corinthians, though, were a more uh, standard type of, of Greek philosophy that they struggle with. But as you read the books, they're very different. They, they have very different um, places where Paul puts emphasis. But it's the same doctrine. It's the same gospel. It's just the apostle wisely, uh, wisely applying it to different churches. Think of this with your kids. Isn't it amazing 
the variations that you, you get out of your genes with your kids. And even if they look like Russian nesting dolls, you know how that is? It's like where that, there's an egg, you open it up, and there's another one. They all look. And so sometimes I don't know which kid's which. I can't tell. But I know what family they belong to. I know who you belong to. Uh, but even when they all look the same, they have very different temperaments. Like there are some kids that, um, you know, if they're hanging out with the, the pagan uh, neighborhood kids, those kids might come to church uh, next week. And there's some kids, if they hang out with the pagan neighborhood kids next week, they might not want to come to church. And you as a parent, you have to read their temperaments. You as a parent have to learn how to uh, raise them up and train them differently according to their differences. This is uh, something that pastors have to do as they, uh, some people have very tender consciences. And you got to be careful how you deal with it. Other people need a rod to their back. They need you to shake them and shock them. So when we come to a text, a pastor has to highlight and bring to bear the things that he thinks is most needful for us right now. And I don't know if this is going to get recorded without that thing, but I'll tell you right now, I don't even care. Like, I'm like with Marlon Lloyd-Jones. I don't, uh, once this is recorded, and this, no one's probably going to agree with me, I don't even consider it a sermon anymore. It's like a different genre. To me, sermons are alive in the moment. There's like an actual something happening here between you and me and the Holy Spirit working through his word that cannot be duplicated uh, by listening to it or even watching it. And you all know that because during the, uh, the pandemic, we all uh, went home for a while and tried to watch church. We tried to. And like, you know, you all got dressed up the first Sunday and you went out there. And then like next Sunday, no one's dressed. Your hair's like, you know, pointing in this direction. And a kid has a bowl of cereal he spills like in the first song. And then the week after that, you're like, what? This is miserable. And that's because it's not the same thing. We are incarnated. We're in bodies. We live in space and time. And God places us there. And sermons are something that happens here. You can't replace that. So I, I'm fine with us not recording or even distributing the sermon audio or video. We do it mostly for those that miss Sundays or are shut-ins. Uh, this is also why I'm against video venues. I think video venues divorce preaching from pastoring. So you actually have to, to know where to focus. You have to be among your people and listen to them and know what they struggle with and whatever. And, um, and that's important. I've, I've watched some pastors who get profile and as they grow, their content starts being for a general audience. Our content are for those of you that live in this region and struggle with Cincinnati sort of things. That's who we, we deal with. Um, this is not for you if you're in Seattle or if you're in California or Texas, whatever. If you get benefit from it, praise the Lord, great. But this is for our people. If there are inside jokes you don't understand, well, move here and you can be part of inside jokes someday, right? You know, but, uh, but they're for us. This is for us. This is for our congregation. And so when you come to a text and people t want you to talk about Southern slavery, why? Why? Because the liberals want to argue about it? Because there's like some small segment that thinks the South will rise again and can't come to terms with why the South failed to begin with? Because of them? Paul's not talking about it. Is that what you need? You're struggling with that? It's what keeps you up at night? You can't let that sort of stuff control us. Which let me end with a few applications from this passage. First, behave towards those put over you, whether rightly or wrongly, in such a way that God's honor and our doctrine is magnified, not maligned. Paul says, all who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of honor so that the name of God and our doctrine would not be spoken against. So why do we regard them as worthy of honor? In part, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. We are ambassadors of Christ, representatives of Christ, and our behavior says a lot about our belief. These slaves have been redeemed 
They've been bought by the blood. They may be slaves according to the world, but Paul would also say in 1 Corinthians, they are freedmen in Christ, right? They will not remain physical slaves in heaven. They will reign forever as kings. And by their behavior, they could testify of the power of their God and and his gospel to their masters. Now, there's things like preach the gospel and when necessary, use words. It's stupid because the gospel's news, right? It's words. But there is something to the core there that the way you conduct yourself and live your life should be a demonstration of the power of the gospel working in the lives of sinners. It should be. And when that's not true, you end up seeing the doctrine of, of, our, of Scripture. You know, you think of, this with, you think of this with Calvinists, right? You know, <clears throat> people say, if you don't have a degree you know, in theology, pick a fight with the Calvinists and you'll get lessons free. Something like that, right? The Calvinists are angry and they just are argumentative and all that. Now, let me just say, I find that basically that's true of every segment online, no matter what they belong to. They could be pacifists and they'll pick a fight with you online. Um, But it it would be a huge contradiction of Calvinism, right? Which is a doctrine that just says that God God, uh, regenerates you. He causes you to be born again through no power of your own. It's very humbling. Your station you have with God, your access to God, is not because of you earned it, because you are depraved. You're fallen in sin, and yet the Lord had mercy on you. That should lead to a level of humility. Uh, That should lead to you to understanding that truth is revealed to you ultimately by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so if you were to engage yourself um, in an arrogant way, it would, it would be to undermine the doctrine that you're pushing. And we can do that in all sorts of ways. You know, I was thinking about a, a famous guy who wrote a book <clears throat> basically on how to create Christian culture. And, uh, and here's his, you know, it's like a 20-step plan or something when you get down to it. It's a very big book. Couldn't finish it. It's very boring. Um, the best thing to do with boring books, like the whole space trilogy, is not to finish it. And... And, uh, but then it, it comes out that during this whole process of writing this book, uh, that his marriage is falling apart and they're getting a divorce. And I was thinking, well, where you start to reclaim the world is in your own home. And that's where it starts. You know, you want to go, you want all these big things. And when people talk about these big things, but you don't see them, I'm going to rule and reign. And you can't rule and reign over your own yard, your own, your own, you know, uh, you're, you're ruling and reigning on your keyboard from your, in your underpants, right? Um, but you can't have dominion in your own home. Uh, that's a sort of hypocrisy and it undermines the doctrine. He's saying, conduct yourself in a way uh, so the name of God is honored. That has to be our motive in all things. That's what, think of all the martyrs throughout church history and how they suffered. And they suffered willingly for the honor of the name of God. And so the doctrine would be uh, demonstrated to be true and powerful. Because Christianity is not only word, but it's power. The Holy Spirit changes you. So our behavior can deny it. I knew a girl who preached the gospel to me when I was an atheist in high school. And she had fornicated with several of my classmates. And I said, look, darling, I don't think God is real. But what's this say he is? I'm just going to help you out. I don't think he wants you to be involved in his PR campaign, right? Because everything about her life was a massive, massive contradiction. What does our PR campaign look like at work? Where else do we experience something like being under the yoke? But at our jobs, jobs can feel monotonous. They can feel hard. So if you have a middle manager, some middle managers, uh, earn the, the despisement <laughs> that's put on them. I don't know if that's a word, but it is now. Um, but what does it look like? What is the quality of your, your attitude and actions at work? Does it cause the name of God and your doctrine to be spoken against or honored? Do they say, man, we got to hire more people like them. You got anyone at your church that's looking for a job? How, how does your conduct uh, bring glory to the Lord? 
Second, do not use your common faith as a way to manipulate Christians who are over you. Paul says in verse 2, those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Warren Wearsby tells the story of a young lady who left a secular job, just a non a non-faith-based uh, job, whatever you want to call it, to work for a Christian organization. She had been there for about a month and had become really disillusioned. And she said, I thought it was going to be heaven on earth. She complained. Instead, there are nothing but problems. And Wearsby asked her if she was working just as hard for her new boss as she did in her previous job. And the look on her face said no. So Wearsby told her, try working harder and show your boss real respect. Just because all of you in the office are saved doesn't mean you can do less than your best. So she took his advice and problems cleared up. She thought that it was just going to be fellowship time. I work for a Christian company and sometimes I'm involved in hiring. And I will tell, or tell you that there's a, a, a balance you're looking for when you're in a Christian company. Like you, you very much want more like-minded people, but you do wonder, do they think like this is just like an unending Bible study? I mean, we, we work 40, 50 hours a week, every week. And uh, while we can talk about those things, we're not hiring you to have uh, the sort of passive fellowship. We're hiring you to do a job. And, and uh, you don't, I don't want you to take advantage of the fact that we are a Christian company. We're quite the opposite. Uh, there is sweet fellowship. And let that build up. Let's build this thing awesome. Let's, like, I, I expect to see more effort from you because we, you're... Uh, supporting fellow Christian brothers in, in the work. And so you don't want to take a... I don't know what's going on. Uh, you don't want to take advantage of other Christians. And you see that in the church in a lot of ways. Um, since I've just thrown everything in the kitchen sink in here. Um, the other thing I'd bring up is these uh, mar uh, multi-level marketing things are like a scourge of many churches. Now, I'm not saying that some of them uh, aren't actual businesses, I'm skeptical, but, um, but you have people that, you know, set up there. I, I think Lulu, Lulu LaRue is not around anymore. So I can pick on that one. Um, they, those little, those really ugly, um, leggings that they're selling, they look like curtains and they're asking like hundreds of dollars for them. Um, they, they come into these churches and they, they use their friendships or relationships to make money. So because the business itself is not super sound, what they're monetizing is not their product as much as the relationships. You see that in a similar way in a church where you have auto mechanics and then you expect the auto mechanic to pay you less uh, or, or charge you less, excuse me. I don't want them to charge me less. What would, like, I, what would you charge for this? I want to pay you. Like, you're my Christian brother. I'm a laborer. I'm worthy of my wages. So are you. I know that truth to be true. I want to pay you for that. And it's not wrong for those people uh, to be charitable and use their gifts in a way, but that sort of expectation that you should have to pay less or it's easier or whatever shouldn't be there. And so this was going on. These slaves had converted, and now they're going to church with their masters, and they're saying, well, we're equal in Christ, rightly so. They are. But then they had applied our radical egalitarianism that uh, eliminates all stations, all hierarchies, and all that. And Paul is saying, not so. No, that is still here. You know, you still have to honor them. As a matter of fact, they're, they're fellow believers. You should work even harder, even harder to honor them. He says, because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Because they are your brethren and you love them, you should do that. Don't fleece the flock. Work harder for your Christian brethren. Build up the church. Third, apply these truths to the whole of your life. Paul tells them to teach, or excuse me, Timothy. He tells Timothy to teach and preach these principles. The word principles is not in the original Greek, but the sense of it is there. And I think he's more or less concluding a section on honor and respect that started back in chapter 4. So chapter 4 starts with how to treat older men, older women, uh, and then it goes into the widows, and that it ends with the proper way that elders should conduct themselves and how you should deal with that. And then that leads right into here to how slaves should relate to their masters. So I think he's, um, 
he's ending with a sort of uh, a section on this principle of honor and respect that should be applied to all life that should be taught. And principles are things that are worked out using wisdom and discernment. And I find that nowadays people treat, they want a compass that provides step-by-step uh, guidance for everything. But scripture doesn't even do that. You know, people will say scripture is an instruction book. Yes, but you need to understand that it instructs us through story. It instructs us through history. And there are didactic passages that are like, do this or do, don't do that. Sometimes you'll hear people say it's not a rule book. And I'm like, well, there's the Decalogue. There's the, you know, thou shall not. <laughs> it's, a, it's a list of rules, actually. Um, but even Jesus shows us that list of rules is a deeper, has deeper meanings. That to hate, uh, to, thou shall not murder means you shouldn't hate your brother. That murder springs from that. And so these are principles that you think through and work through in your whole life, which requires meditation. It means you, you need like something approaching silence to think about it. And so what God gives us is a compass and a map, like a topographical map that guides us through life. Not these step by steps. There's a lot of discernment. That's one reason you need to be in a church. That's one reason uh, that elders are here to help work through complicated issues and say, how do we apply uh, scriptural principles to the situation you find yourself in because there's not always a one-for-one -one analog. Now, one last application. When people talk about slavery, people love to um, think that they're better than their forefathers. People love to prosecute the crimes of their forefathers, right? But it's a look at the birdie, right? It's distraction. Let's talk about their sins so we don't have to talk about our sins. And there's many ways that the, where we live now, our time now, uh, our country is really a slave state. Uh, I mean, primarily it's economic and financially, but we're seeing it governmentally where they're just, uh, it's, it's crazy. It's, their tentacles are getting into everything. Um, but I, I want to point out one to you that I know very well because I worked in this industry for a long time, and that's uh, student loans. So I, I think the way we have student loans in our country is leading to a modern form of slave, slavery. And I was talking to a friend who um, is recently married and asking well, what, how much debt does his wife owe? And it was uh, well above $200,000 that they have to pay off. $200,000, right? Like a whole house and then some. And in our country, you can get 50, about 50K of unsubsidized and subsidized uh, student loans that are not based on your credit, your income or anything, right? So you give $50,000 to some 17-year-old 17 17 kid, and he signs a promissory note. And then that promissory note, you just renew every year, right? So you don't like really, they don't usually look at it. I will tell you in that promissory note, it's all there. Like, it's very plain and in your face. Um, and it's guaranteed and ultimately backed by the government. So the banks are like, yeah, we can't lose. Here you go. Here's your $50,000 to go study, you know, gender studies or, or I, I, some really niche thing. Or, or to spend on, like, I remember, I, I think I spent like $1,000, which is probably a good deal now, on uh, the food plan at, um, at NKU. So I could have uh, getta and egg omelets every day and, and not expand my learning, but my waistline. Um, but th it's guaranteed. Uh, and the reason uh, it's guaranteed is because you can't discharge them in bankruptcy. You can't discharge uh, government-backed. Some of the private loans you can, but not government-backed. And here's another thing that happens. That interest that's on those student loans, it gets added to the principal balance. It's, it's called capitalization. And then if you don't pay after about three quarters of a year, if you don't pay for whatever reason, it's not a deferment anymore, uh, then it goes into a default status. When student loans go into default status, 25% of the balance can be added back on top of it as a collection cost. And they will. So a $10,000 loan magically becomes $12,500 when it goes in default. Then interest keeps adding to it. The interest then adds to the principal balance. And it grows and it grows and grows. And when I used to call people to collect debt is what I did. Um, I was uh, not the grace of Jesus, but the law of Moses back then. And uh, I would hold them account. And they would, you would look at what the loan started as. 
And like started as like 10 grand. And it's like up to $30,000, right? And one of the things that uh, makes slavery unjust is when you can't be freed, when there's no way to free yourself. And we're building a, building a system where it's getting harder and harder for people to ever have economic freedom. And who is their master, right? Their master's not even private corporations. It's, it's the government. They're enslaved. So my main issue with those debts is that they aren't dischargeable. Um, if they become dischargeable in bankruptcy, I'm not saying that fixes the whole thing, but I'll tell you right now, if you're not sure if you're going to get your money back, you're not going to give it out so easily, right? It'll change. It'll, it'll change really quick. So what I want to warn you right now, before you look back and judge these guys, we, uh, we sold our own children into slavery, uh, getting foolish degrees with really low ROI. And now it's difficult for them to buy houses or get married or manage it. It's very uh, disheartening. And so we can look back on the ancients. We can look back on the South or whatever. But these sins have a way of creeping back into society. And we're smart. We know how to make them look like clean, you know, nice sins, right? We're not, we're not trying to enslave a whole generation or two. We're just trying to help them get an education. It's even, it's even more despicable. So what I want to urge all of you out there, all you young people, uh, do not enslave yourself to anything. Do not enslave yourself to images online. Do not enslave yourself to, to these sort of debts, whether it's credit card debt or student loan debt. So conduct yourself in such a way that the, uh, the honor of God is at the forefront. The doctrine is uh, uh, being uh, uh, not maligned, but represented well and magnified. And also in your own life, Show that you are free and make the choices of a free man, a man that's not controlled by his desires and uh, full of malicious intent. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it challenges us. We thank you that it applies to all times. God, give us wisdom in how to apply this to the whole of our life, Lord, that you would be honored, uh, that your doctrine would go forth, whether it's the gospel or the finer points, Father. We ask that we would uh, live as free men, namely free from sin in our pursuit of you, Lord. We ask that all this in the name of your son. Amen.